Thank you. When we discuss here, and over the years, I heard it again and again, strategic questions, we always start from the, from the challenge and the response. What is it that we have to deal with and what can we do about achieving a successful response to this particular challenge? And this is, of course, in the final analysis, the most important. But there is a precondition of understanding the strategic environment. Before you even start asking yourself, what do you want? The question is, what is the environment, the overall strategic environment that you're working in? What, are, what is the inner logic of it? And if you can understand this inner logic, you can then much better make decisions about specific issues. Speaking from my experience of discussing these issues with major leaders on the uh, political and military level, I've always had the very interesting experience of speaking to people who instinctively have a certain perception of the strategic environment, but not very often have made themselves clear with the overall picture of it. So I will try to speak about the Middle East as it is today in the perspective of the last 100 years. Now, I think you should be grateful because in the Middle East I could have started 5,000 years ago, but then you would never have dinner. I think that the last 100 years is enough, long enough in order to give us a perspective and short enough so that we don't fall into despair. This always reminds me as a lecturer that a lecture should be like a skirt. In other words, short enough to be interesting and long enough to cover the subject. So here we also try to bring together some kind of a broad perspective, but narrow enough so that it is operative for us. If you want to understand the Middle East in the last 100 years, I would call it, following Charles Dickens, the tale of four revolutions. Not the tale of two cities, but the tale of four revolutions. We have a Turkish revolution, we have an Egyptian revolution, an Iranian revolution, and an Israeli revolution. And if you want to understand the Middle East, and if you really want to focus on what counts, focus on these four countries. By the way, in the ancient Middle East, you should have looked at Mesopotamia and the Nile Valley. But today, look at these four countries. Egypt, Turkey, Iran, and Israel. The rest matter much, much less than these four. And all these countries have undergone recently, recently being 100 years, major revolutions. The Turks even had two revolutions, the Ataturk Revolution 100 years ago and the Erdogan Revolution that was a counter-revolution only 20 years uh, ago. In Egypt, you had perhaps the most important and interesting revolution in the 1950s and the 1960s when Gamal Abdel Nasser suggested an idea of Arab unity that actually spoke, I'm using Nasser's own term, from the ocean to the Gulf, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Arab Gulf that we sometimes call the Persian Gulf. And he managed in a messianic movement to move millions of people, many millions of people in a way that dictated the reality in the Middle East of the 1950s and the 1960s. In Iran, more than 40 years ago, 43 years ago, we had a major revolution that is impacting the Middle East today more than any other. And in Israel, people are not aware, not that we had a revolution, just the government changed a few years ago, so I'm not speaking about a revolution in the Israeli government, but Zionism is a revolution of the Jewish people. And if you don't understand the revolutionary nature of Zionism, it is also very difficult to understand the Middle East because without a good understanding of Israel today, you can't understand what is happening in the Middle East. Now, what happened with these four revolutions? Two of them reached a dead end and I don't think at the moment have a major impact. First of all, Nasser's revolution reached a dead end when Nasser died. It even reached a dead end in 1967, but it lingered on for a few more years. 
And the most important thing about this revolution that at the time dictated everything in the Middle East is that nobody is today wanting to go back to Nasser's time. On the 28th of September, when recently, in 2020, it was 50 years to the death of Gamal of the Nasser, nobody in the Middle East said, I want to go back to Gamal of the Nasser. So this revolution died and will not be resurrected in, under any circumstances that I can imagine at the moment. Erdogan's revolution also reached a dead dead. He practically failed in everything he did. And now he is retracting some of it and he's trying somehow to manage, but it's a failure. It's a total failure. And here you have the two successes, the Iranian revolution and the Israeli revolution. The Israeli revolution is a situation where a country that only 60, 70, even 50 years ago was on the verge of either going or not going, functioning or not functioning, is today a major power, recognized as a major power beyond the Middle East, let alone in the Middle East. Not a superpower, but a major regional power. And it is a success. In Iran, there are two successes. First of all, the Iranian society is very impressive, very, very impressive. And by the way, it makes it very difficult for Israel. It was easy to fight Arabs. It's much more difficult to fight Iranians. They're much more capable than Arabs. More than that, unfortunately, the Iranian revolution is a success in the sense that everybody in the Middle East is afraid of Iran, and particularly Arabs are afraid of Iran. So from an Iranian revolutionary perspective, it is a success, this particular revolution. And while the local elements, particularly Israel and Iran, are rising in power, the global powers left the Middle East. First of all, Britain in the 1950s, at the latest, basically no longer was, it's the decolonization process and we discussed it, if you remember, only yesterday in a different context. And Britain, I think I will use the term that Tony Blair used. He said, we used to be rule Britannia, now we're trying to be cool Britannia. Okay, they were Obama to have the American role in determining world power, and he was just seeking a way to get out, and you have today Biden in going in the same direction. And don't misunderstand me. I think it's a very good idea from the Amer for the Americans to pivot to Asia, to go to where it is really important, namely to the South China Sea and what have you, in Asia. This is a correct decision. But instead of doing it in the best possible way that the Americans could have done it, namely to undermine their enemies and to support the allies of the United States, the Americans are doing the extreme opposite. They have strengthened Iran and undermined Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Israel. This is the contribution of Barack Obama to the reality, to the global reality of today. So, the British are out, the Russians are out, or the Soviet Union is out, the Americans are on the way out, so local powers become much more important. And therefore, what we have in the Middle East today is not what we used to have, and here we must adjust to a new reality not the Arab-Israeli conflict as a determining factor. By the way, this is very popular to say in Europe and also in America, particularly under democratic um, administrations, as if you bring together Israel and the Arabs, or even more specifically, if you're completely ignorant about the Middle East, you speak about Israel and the Palestinians, and then this will stabilize the Middle East, or the Middle East will be less unstable if you bring Whatever happens between Israel and the Palestinians is completely irrelevant to what happens in the Middle East. You take the two extremes and the impact on the Middle East is you can digitally uh, describe it as zero. So instead of having the Arabs on one side, this is a Nasser construction that no longer exists, the Arabs on the one hand and Israel on the other hand, what you have today, and we will come back to it in a moment, you have an Israeli-Arab coalition 
against Iran and to some extent against Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean, but primarily against Iran for reasons that I will explain in a moment. Now, I very strongly agree to the idea that from an Israeli point of view, it is very important to find out what the danger is to Israel and to see to it that it cannot materialize. I have no problem with it whatsoever. I only want to zoom out and to look at this question in a regional context rather than in a bilateral context. And to say the following, and I'm speaking about Israel in that case, not because I'm an Israeli or this is the subject that I've studied more than others, but because if you want to understand what's going on in the Middle East and to see what is the core conflict and what ceased to be the core conflict and what the new reality is and what the new options are, you can't discuss it without discussing Israel. Or if you want, the Israeli revolution, the product of the Israeli revolution. And what is the basic Israeli fear? And I'm speaking not what happened in the last 50 years or 73, four years since the establishment of the State of Israel, but since the very beginning of, say, the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, primarily the beginning of the 20th century, what was the fear of the tiny Jewish existence in the region? Basically saying, this region has enormous potential. Again, it stretches from the Atlantic Ocean to the Persian Gulf. It has a lot of oil. It has a lot of international waterways that are important. Think of the Suez Canal, the, the Red Sea, the, the approach to Asia. It has a huge human potential. And if all this potential works against Israel because it is more alien to the Middle East in the eyes of the people who live in the Middle East than anything else, then Israel is doomed. And we had a demonstration in 1939 to what can happen. The British that were very supportive of the Zionist, the Zionist project and without the British support, the Zionist project could not have struck roots in Palestine at the time in the 1920s, adopted an anti-Zionist policy in the late 1930s, and the people who adopted it in Britain, some of them were very pro-Zionist, like Winston Churchill, but they didn't have a choice because the message was, if you alienate the Arabs and even a part of the Muslims, then you, if you're about to go into a world war, 1939, you cannot afford to have the Arabs or a very large portion of the Arabs and some portion of the Muslims. And remember, the British had the Indian army, but at the time, India included what today is Pakistan and Bangladesh, and many of the soldiers were Muslim soldiers. So once the region managed to tell, to send Britain a message, if you will not support, the, if you will not stop supporting the Jews, then you will have to deal with the Arabs and with the Muslims. The British adopted an anti-Zionist policy in 1939. And people who were aware of this became even more aware because were it not for the Second World War and Britain would have continued to be the determining power in the Middle East, maybe the State of Israel would not have been established. So. The objective of Israel is break up Arab solidarity, break up regional solidarity. Everything you do must be focused on one thing, break up their solidarity, find somebody who will work with you against everybody else. And it should be the most important part at this given moment. In 1948, we are st sometimes trying to tell ourselves the story as if we fought Arab, seven Arab armies. Now, actually, there were five. Saudi Arabia and Yemen did not participate. And from the seven Arab armies, two were not very important, the Lebanese and the Syrian. One was very important, the Egyptian. 
One in the beginning of the war was crucial, and this is the Jordanians, and in 1947, 48, 49, the Jordanians fought with Israel against Egypt and the Palestinians. And had King Abdullah I joined the Arab consensus, had he not worked with Israel against Egypt and the Palestinians, did we not have a strategic understanding with King Abdullah I? I doubt if in the summer of 1948, Israel would have continued to exist. And it was crucial to understand, and this was Ben-Gurion's strategy after the Holocaust, understanding that the three, four million Jews who could have come from the Eastern Europe where they reached a dead end, and a large portion of them could have come to Israel and given Israel a majority from the Mediterranean to the Jordan. Once this is not possible, partitioning the land becomes a Zionist objective. And this is what Ben-Gurion did. And he understood Abdallah wants what later came to be called the West Bank. The, the term is only from 1950, but I'm speaking about this area. Abdallah wants East Jerusalem, let him have it. And Israel wants not to have it because otherwise you establish a Jewish state with an Arab majority. This was the most important decision of Ben-Gurion, both before the war and the, the Zionist movement approached the UN and said, we want a country without this area. 1946, there is a map, an official map that the leadership suggested, the Israeli leadership suggested. So, Abdallah wants this area and he wants Jerusalem. We don't want it. Here we have a strategic partnership between Israel and Jordan that made it possible for Israel to survive the early stages of the 1948 war. And this was a major success. And after the war, for a while, things were disorganized, but then, 1954, Nasser becomes this messianic leader of the Arab world. And for the first time, Israel is facing all the Arabs either because countries want to support Nasser or because they're afraid of him. It doesn't really matter what you as an Arab leader want vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. You have only one choice. If you don't support Nasser, your own people will hang you on the nearest lamppost. Because Nasser managed to speak to Arab elites throughout the Arab world, and King Hussein, who wanted a good relationship with Israel, couldn't possibly avoid going to war with Israel in 1967, not because he believed that he will win the war, he knew that he cannot win the war, but his real choice in 1967 was join the war, lose one bank, the West Bank, or don't join the war and lose both banks, the West Bank and the East Bank, namely all of Jordan, and the top 12 inches of your physical existence. If you will not join the war, no matter what the outcome, Jordan will cease to exist and the Hashemite monarchy will cease to exist. So he goes to war knowing that he will lose Jerusalem and the West Bank. To give you only one specific anecdote here, we approached him through three different channels on the eve of the Six-Day War, and we said to him, you have already started bombarding Jerusalem, but if you stop, we will leave you alone. We have no designs whatsoever on the region. And his answer was, I'm quoting verbatim, the chips are down, we are at war. Because by the time we approached him, the Jordanian army was already led, commanded by an Egyptian general who took his orders from Egypt. Because King Hussein could not afford to show his own people that he is not willing to destroy Israel. 
and this is what people believed at the time in the Arab world, is about to happen if we have a, if we have a war. So, on the one hand, we came out of the 1948 war very successful in the sense of having a basis where you can build a state and for a decade of relative tranquility, we were capable of building this structures that made it possible for us to become a first world state. On the other hand, we failed until 1967 to break Arab solidarity because Nasser managed to forge such an Arab solidarity and at the time we didn't have a good answer for it. Now what happened in 1967? We won the war and the question is, what is it really that we want? And here it was said, I mean, these words were said, but it was not a clear concept as it should have been, that our objective is essentially a deal saying 48 for 67. In other words, what we want from Egypt. Egypt is by far the most important Arab state. Compared to Egypt, everything else is uh, negligible. Egypt is the only real country in the Arab world. By the way, the Egyptians are aware of it and they call themselves Umad Dunya, the mother of the world. Okay? The, it reminds me the way the, the British, in the heyday of the British Empire, had their weather forecast. They used to say, there is fog over the channel, the continent is cut off. Th this perception of we are what counts and the rest is, uh, you know, a misunderstanding. And the idea was, take the important Arab state, the most important Arab state, the only state that the Arabs cannot do without, and break it not convince it, break it by force, by saying the following. If you want the Sinai Peninsula, this is 19th of June, 1967, 11 days after the war. If you want the Sinai Peninsula, you can have it. We will withdraw tomorrow. There was an Israeli government decision on the subject. By the way, secret Israeli government decision communicated to the Egyptians by the Americans. You can get everything you've lost, but you have to have a separate agreement. Now, we usually emphasize the term peace in a peace agreement. I don't care about peace. I want it to be separate. In other words, we can do whatever we want with the rest of the Arab states, and you will not become involved. And if you'll give this to us, you can have the, the Sinai Peninsula a day after the, 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 this decision. No problem whatsoever, but give us a separate Arab, a separate agreement. And what Nasser said, and what the whole Arab world after Nasser said, you are trying to destroy everything we are about. And we said yes, but you don't have a choice. If you don't give us a separate agreement, you will get nothing. And it took three wars. 67 war, the war of attrition, and the Yom Kippur war. In order to convince Sadat, Nasser died in 1970, but to convince Sadat before the war and after the war, even after the 60, uh, 73, where in the beginning we had very serious problems in this war, even after this war that is perceived by Egypt to be a success, at least publicly, not, the, not in closer circles, but publicly. The message was, you want the Sinai, you can have it, but give us a separate agreement. And in the final analysis, the Egyptians were broken. I mean, perhaps it's not polite to say so, but being nice is not exactly the only strategy you have. The Israeli message was, this is what we need, uh, we need from you. And in 1979, this is exactly what Israel got from Egypt. So when Israel was stupid enough in 1982 to occupy an Arab capital city, Beirut, 
It was, from an Egyptian point of view, the question is not, is it smart, is it not smart? They said, are we willing to go to war for that? The answer was no, and the Egyptian response was nothing. I think they called the ambassador back or any other thing that has no significance whatsoever. Israel wanted to destroy the Iraqi reactor in Baghdad in 1981. We destroyed it. The Egyptians did not respond. We occupied Beirut. The Egyptians did not respond. We later destroyed also the nuclear reactor in Syria. Of course, the Egyptians did not respond. And it is deeply ingrained in Egypt. Now, something that I will be surprised if somebody here knows. 45 years after the war, Sadat speaks to his generals. And he speaks to them about the 1973 war that is perceived in many places as an Israeli failure. And Nasser says, and Sadat, I'm, I, I'm sorry, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the, the president of Egypt today, says to the top officers of the Egyptian army, a few years ago, he says the following. You guys are great heroes because you were willing to fight Israel in 1973. Now, we are Siat, and Israel is a Mercedes. And we know that Siat cannot win a Mercedes. But you are so brave, you were willing to try. So the perception that you have here a very strong country, and therefore the option of Egypt going to war is out of the question. More than that, to a very large extent, today the Egyptian national interest rests on cooperation with Israel. We'll come to that in a moment. But the big change, the dramatic change, was 1971 with the separate peace agreement, and this is removing the headstone. Now, you know in the traditional building, you remove the headstone, the whole thing collapses. Egypt is the headstone. Without Egypt, there is no Arab world. And the Arab world tried to function without Egypt and failed. And to use a Churchillian term, if you remember in the first successes of the Second World War, he said, this is not the end, this is not even the beginning of the end, maybe it is the end of the beginning. So the end of the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflict is 1971. And now we are at the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli Arab conflict because an interlude, a very unpleasant and long interlude, but no more than interlude, is now out of the way. What is the interlude? We had a fantasy that unfortunately an Israeli government also adopted, the Israeli government of Yitzhak Rabin, that actually what determines the welfare of Israel and the ability to break up the solidarity of the Arab world against Israel is the Palestinian issue. So the idea was, let's try to reach an understanding with the Palestinians. And my problem with Rabin, and I told him so more than once in our discussion before and after Oslo, was that exactly what I'm trying to speak about here today, namely the need to understand fundamental cultural things, must come before you think about operative steps. Rabin had in mind operative steps that made sense to him. I told him they don't make sense because they don't fit into the culture of the Middle East in general, and the Palestinians in particular. And finally, it collapsed exactly because this was disregarded, because this warning was disregarded. So we had the fantasy that it can be settled through the Palestinians. We convinced the Europeans and the Americans. Then the Americans put pressure on Israel to continue and do it. And this interlude is over. If somebody doesn't understand today the marginality, if not the complete irrelevance of the Palestinian issue to what is happening in the Middle East, then 
He must have a developed sense of humor or completely being cut off from realities in the Middle East. This interlude is over. And then what came to light, what came to light, and now let us focus about something that I've already mentioned yesterday, it was even mentioned again today, but we need to come back to it. A, that Israel came out of all its problems, including the Palestinian issue, having been hurt here and there on public opinion issues and so on, and disagreement inside Israel, but basically Israel is getting stronger and stronger both in objective terms and what is much more important in the perception of Arabs. To me, the question if I'm strong is less important than the question if my enemy thinks that I'm strong. So in the final analysis, I think it is true both objectively and subjectively, but subjectively in my view is by far uh, more important. So the strength of Israel on the one hand the weakness of the Arabs, as perceived by the Arabs, became very clear after the so-called Arab Spring. In other words, Arabs used to believe, alongside many Europeans, that what is wrong with the Arab world is that the leaders are corrupt and the, the uh, regimes are autocratic and if the people will rise and kick out its bad leaders and bring up good leaders, then things will improve in the Arab world. And when myself and others like me approached and said, look, the Arab leaders may not be the best thing that we have, but Arab society is the only thing that is worse than the Arab leaders, then this was described as being racist. Because how can the people be bad? People are inherently good, aren't they? No, they're not. Let me give you a good example. Look at Muammar Gaddafi. He is not only cruel and repulsive and whatever you have, but also not exactly fully balanced with everything working properly. The Brits and the French believe that if you remove Gaddafi, you can have a better Libya. Okay, Gaddafi is dead. The situation in Libya today without Gaddafi is worse than what it was with Gaddafi because the Libyan society expressed what it really is. When you ask the Egyptian society to elect Egypt, the Muslim brothers, okay, and brought them to the fore, the number one problem with Egypt, as it is with the rest of the Arab world, is that they cannot meet the challenges of the 21st century. I think they will be very soon in a position to meet the challenges of the 19th century. I'm not sure about the 20th century. And who is less fit to it than anybody else in Egypt? The Muslim brothers. Who do they want to elect? The Muslim brothers. So, today, for the first time, after this decade of the Arab Spring, there is a deep recognition in the Arab world that they are helplessly weak. And you know what? I'm not exactly a humanitarian in the sense that I want my enemies to be strong. And I have a lot of memories of how much damage Arabs did to Israel. I'm telling you that as an Israeli, I am sorry that the Arabs are so weak. I wish they were stronger. For instance, Egypt is the only anchor for regional stability. I want Egypt to have a future. I can't see it. And many Egyptians can't see it. And I wish they had. For Israel, it would be much better. Forget, of course, for the Egyptians. But even for Israel, it would be much better. When I spent two years in Washington as a visiting professor at Georgetown University, they called me the second Jordanian ambassador. And I protested. I said, I'm the first unpaid Jordanian ambassador because whenever the Americans asked, what can we do in the Middle East? I said, in terms of cost benefit, Jordan costs very little and the benefit is enormous. Help Jordan, more important than anything else. I would love to have a stronger Jordan. Unfortunately, this is not on the cards.
And I don't have to speak about what's happening in Yemen or in Syria or in Iraq. You can see for yourself or, or in, uh, in Tunisia where we believe that, uh, you know, here is the first sign of democracy. Maybe it will emerge. Okay, the United Arab Emirates is, an, is a success. Yes, but it's an exception and unfortunately a very small excep uh, exception in the Arab world. Now, looking at the broader picture, what do Arabs see? They see the weak Arab world, the strong Iran, the strong and aggressive Iran, the unreliable Americans, and the trustworthy Israelis. This is the Arab percep perception, okay? I join it, I think it is correct, but the important thing is not that in my analytical judgment this is correct. The importance is that this is their perception. Their perception is we are weak, Iran is strong, Iran is trying to destroy us, Iran can destroy us, it is strong enough to destroy us, you can't trust the Americans, they are of course infinitely more important than the Israelis, but you can't trust them, particularly since Obama, you can't trust them. And the only force in the Middle East that will actually fight the Iranians, not for the Arabs, but for itself, will be Israel. So if we want anybody to defend us from being liquidated by the Iranians, it is Israel. So we work with Israel. Now, it used to be a supreme taboo in the Arab world to show films where there are Jewish actors and actresses, okay? Of course, to speak about cooperation with Israel on anything was a taboo. And speaking about security cooperation with Israel was the ultimate taboo. And this is what people were accusing each other for being traitors. A few months ago, uh, the uh, Deputy Foreign Minister of Bahrain gives a television interview, and among other things, he says, we're working with the Mossad. So the interviewer said, you're saying this, of course, sarcastically. And he says, no, we work with the Mossad. The head of Mossad was here. And then in three minutes, he says seven times that he works with the Mossad. The Moroccans are saying, we want a security detail coming to Morocco. Uh, Saudi Arabia allows an Israeli Air Force plane to fly over Saudi Arabia with the Israeli Defense Minister. You have Israel conducting naval exercises in the Persian Gulf with local Arab fleets. We are speaking about a dramatic change in reality. And again, people speak about normalization. Okay, so you can have kosher food in Manama or in Abu Dhabi, I'm sure for General Anamjor it's very important. But as far as I'm concerned, normalization is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in strategic cooperation. I'm interested in the fact that not only is there today no Arab solidarity against Israel, there is Arab-Israeli solidarity against Iran. Okay? This is a completely different reality and I think that if we don't understand this particular sea change in the Middle East, then we also don't understand the position of Europe or, in, or the United States. To give only one example, I remember thousands of discussions where people said, well, on the one hand, we should support Israel, it's the right thing. On the other hand, oil, gas, markets, money, petrodollars, whatever. Today we are in a new reality. You want Arab gas, you want Arab oil, speak to Israel. Let me put it this way. When the Americans want the Saudis to increase their oil production so that uh, in Arizona the price at the pump station will be lower with an 8.4 inflation digit in America. I know you have worse in Europe, but for the Americans, 8.4 is terrible. They need to speak to the Saudis. 
And the Saudis basically tell them, where when, were you when we needed you against Iran? You work to strengthen Iran and to undermine Saudi Arabia. You came to us and spoke to us about human rights. Okay? Okay, human rights is a great objective. Always support human rights. But if you want an ally, will you demand him to respect human rights? Imagine, for instance, Roosevelt telling Stalin, oh, you want to help us defeat Hitler? Why don't you first adopt a liberal uh, constitution? And you can't do it. There are not enough good guys in the world. You have to work with whatever you have. And the oil was not allocated according to human rights. So today, if the Americans want to speak to the Saudis about having a higher production, they better speak to the Israelis because the Israelis will listen, the, the Saudis will listen to the Israelis not less than the Americans. Of course, in the final analysis, they depend on America. Of course, in the final analysis, the United States is infinitely stronger than Israel. But today, these two issues are not separate. They come together. So the significance of the Israeli situation is different than before because for the first time we are a local regional power in the full sense of the term. We used to be a regional power in military terms. Later we became a regional power in economic terms. Now we are a regional power in political terms because we are part of the strategic structure. We can work with one Arab state against another Arab state, with one Arab state against non-Arab Muslim state or non-Muslim state. In other words, this is how a regional power works politically. So if I may stop here by quoting something that is always convenient for me to say in German, you know this term, Gott gibt Schultern nach der Bürde. Okay? God gives shoulders according to the burden. The burden of Israel is infinitely stronger than most people realize, and the shoulders of Israel are much bigger than most Israelis realize. So, this is true objectively, but again, it is much more important that this is what people in the Arab world think, and in Iran, by the way, think. The Iranians hate Israel not only because they have strong anti-Semitic elements and they're revolutionaries and they want really, they're really committed to the destruction of Israel, but also because Israel is their number one enemy. Because the one thing that stands be between uh, Iran and, um, and hegemonizing the Middle East is Israel, and the Iranians know it. So when they know that Israel is what I described here, this is an extremely important deterrent power in this region when you look at the overall picture. Again, let me stop with what I started with. You want to define your objectives? First of all, understand this strategic environment. Now, if somebody wants to tell me this is a wrong perception of the strategic environment. Let's discuss another uh, perception of the strategic environment. But let's discuss the strategic environment before we come to the point of asking ourselves what to do. Because you always need to ask yourself first, what is it that I'm facing? And only then to ask, what do I need to do? Thank you.